thank God for dedicated choir members and choir directors. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. Don't take your blessings for granted. Let us turn our attention now to the book of Acts, beginning uh, with chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. When you have found it or see it, please stand to give reverence to God's word. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by that right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. As the Holy Spirit will guide on this morning, I want to share from the thought, there is power in his name. Let us pray. Now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth, but the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For God, you are our strength and holy redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When um, I've seen this text many times, and for some reason when I, when I read it this time, uh, I could not help but think about uh, Ralph Ellison's novel, The Invisible Man. It has been years since I had uh, read the book, so I'm going to be honest with you. I had to get a snapshot synopsis to make sure I could remember uh, the, the, the nuances of that novel. And it was uh, entitled The Invisible Man, uh, not because he was literally invisible, but sociologically he was invisible. It, it was the socialization of the politics and religion and the laws of the 1930s that he became overseen as the invisible. They, they, they didn't know him for who he was. Educated, eloquent preacher or speaker, should I say, eloquent speaker, scholarship recipient, ones who, whose character and intelligence required him to have equality with all people. They didn't know him for who he, he is or was. They knew him only for what he was. An African American male. Black man in the 30s, 1930s. Time when, when, when life overtly did not matter for people that looked like him. He was simply nameless throughout the entire text book. Yet, the author, the narrator, uses his, this, this racial tension and prejudice and unfair and unjust socialization to eventually elevate him as a person who could take lemon and make lemonade and decide that he would not be ignored anymore. But he would, be, he would rise up and be seen. Yet, intentionally, he has no name. Because he realizes, the author realizes that his plight could be somebody else's. 
where his name is voided out, maybe somebody need to put their name in. You feel a sense that you're treated as if you don't exist. This is what's going on, and I see in this text here is a man sitting at the gate, nameless. They, they, don't, they don't know who he is, they just know what he is. He's, he, he's, he's to them a disabled, lame, legless, handicapped, of no value, sits there, invisible. And, and nobody seems to, to care about his existence. And, and the question has to be proposed as he sits at the gate called beautiful. He sits at the entrance of the church. Why during the hour of prayer would he sit on the outside and not come on in? Why, why would, would the people who brought him that far not carry him all the way? Because the truth of the matter is in those times that the infirm was not able to come into the church. Lord have mercy. It's a sad day when, when the church bars those who need healing from the house of healing. It's a sad day when, when, when the people who look for hope can't come to the house of hope. It is a sad day when folk will bar from, from the house where there's power and people who need power and say you cannot come in here. Yet the socialization of the time would shape his behavior that he would sit at the gate every day and he came with the wrong reason. They made him feel invisible and so he acted invisible. purpose for the ninth hour, the three o'clock gathering, that people would gather in the church because the Jewish tradition was they would pray at least three times a day, and they all would, would gather at that hour, and they would come to the temple in order that they might be able to talk to the Lord, and, and yet he doesn't come for the purpose of prayer. He comes for the purpose of money. He, come, he, comes bear, he comes begging for money, but he doesn't come begging for prayer. That's what, so, that's what the social order can do. It can, it can put you in the wrong frame of mind. He comes in and he, he sits at the gates and, and he, he's asking them, for money, and, and, and he, he, he doesn't realize how close he is to the power of God. Purpose, and, and, and that's a sad thing because every now and again, you have to wake up in the morning. And you need to understand what's your purpose of coming here. That, that, that it, 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 it seems to be true. If, you, if that's all you come looking for is money then that's all you'll probably get out of it. That every now and again, we need to understand our purpose for coming to the house of the Lord. I believe that some of us forget the purpose of the, of the house. We forget the purpose of what it re, why it really exists. And that's why a church can always become something of a secondary concern and choice because we have lost focus of the real purpose for having this building and Christ giving it to us. But I want you to know that I don't care who doesn't welcome me. I really don't care what, the, what my neighbor looks like or what people might say about me my purpose for coming to church would never be about my brother and sister and your opinion but I've come to church and you should come to church for the sole purpose that I've come to have a little talk with Jesus it doesn't matter if you don't get nobody to shout with you but my purpose for coming to church after a hell of five week I need to know is there a word from the Lord I need God to encourage my heart to 
to remind me to keep on keeping on. When the world has thrown me away and kicked me to the curb, I need the church to remind me that you are still wonderfully and fearfully made. I need the church to remind me you can do all things. You are the head and not the tail. When I come to church, I come to know if the Lord got a word for me. No matter who's singing and who's praying, doesn't matter how many people in the pew. It doesn't matter how I feel. I know this. This is the house of the Lord, and I need God to come and talk to me. That's why, and I, I tell you, unless you have a per understand your purpose for church, if your purpose is wrong, then you'll keep skipping it. And you'll let everything outrun you. Because your purpose is wrong. Because the social order says church is no longer valuable. But I've come to let you know there's power in his name. He also had a perception how he saw. And, 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 and during this hour, there, there is an, there has to be an influx of people. There's a crowd that, 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 that's coming. So that means when Peter and John were walking to the church, they weren't walking by themselves, but they were walking to eat with each other. And, and, and the lame and crippled man looks up from a distance and he sees just those two. Though there's a crowd that may be surrounding him, he sees Peter and John. He sees them. And, 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 it, and it's something that Peter and John said that I, I want to be clear about. Because there's a statement when they get there and they get close and they have a car, he says, silver and gold we have. Now, now some people think he may, they may have come broke. No, they came with their tithes and their offering. And it's not your business to tell God or to distrib distribute God's money the way you want. You bring it to the storehouse. So I don't think they were broke. I just think they had God's money and it wasn't theirs to distribute. <laughs> Trying to help somebody who think they can give to another cause and forget the church. But they came and there was something about them came. Even though they say silver and gold they didn't have, they must have looked rich. He, 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 he was able to perceive that there was something different about those two. He, he could see something was on the inside and it was showing up on the outside. That, that I believe that's all Christian that you and I should carry a perception of God's presence. That we should not have to put crosses around our neck, put big Bibles under our armpits, shouldn't have, have to praise the Lord salutations for people to know that we have a relationship with our Lord. But they, when they see us coming, even from a distance, uh, they should be able to identify that must be one of God's children. If they can look at me and tell that I'm a West boy in my neighborhood, then I want them to look at me and tell that I'm a God's boy when I'm in your hood. Because what God puts on the inside of us should show up on the outside. And so he didn't know what he saw, but I know what he saw. He saw Jesus and two men that he thought were strangers. Come on in here. But when they got close, he had a self-perception that was wrong. That, that he put his head down and he turned away just like the slave master, the slave couldn't look at his master. What he did was he not only did he, did he, he look down and, and not only did he look away, but I believe he looked at his crippledness because he wanted Peter and, and John to see his plight and not see an answer. 
And sometimes the self-perception that we have is that we allow, we let, we see ourselves as other people see us. We let people identify who we are rather than to know who God has identified as us. We perceive what people, don't worry about what people think about you. People always are going to think something less of you than what you really are. I believe there's player haters even in the church. So don't let people decide to determine who you you are you might be crippled but you ain't got to be dumb you might not have a lot but it don't mean that you don't have something you may not be the best looking person in the house but you ain't ugly either so you need to and so he had a self-perception and it was wrong because he allowed the world to and I love what Peter and John did they said look at us let me explain it. They said when they walked up to him, as he looked down and they were standing, they said to him, stop looking down on yourself. Look up. That every now and again, we need to remind Christians and believers and folk who feel marginalized and disenfranchised, stop looking down. Look up uh, and see that you are God's child. Look up and know that you are an heir of salvation. Look up and know that God loves you. Look up and know that you are the brother, the sister to a savior named Jesus. going to treat him like everybody else. He, 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 he presumed that even when he looked up, they won't give him money. He, 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 he presumed that they were going to look at his crippledness and like everyone else make him invisible. John does what the church must do. The reason why he had that presumption is that he's when he when they get to the gate, he was born that way. But by the time Peter and John meet him, he's forty plus years old. He's he's been getting the same treatment for so long. He he presumed everybody would treat him the same way. And, 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 and let me put the, the onus in the churches and your hands. Forty years, when we act like we don't care, and we are God's representatives in the world, then people will think God don't care. When the church sees what's going on in our world and you act like you don't care, then the presumption from the outside is that God doesn't care. But I believe that the church, not the politician, needs to get mad at the injustice that we see. And I don't care who's in the office, but we should be mad at what this administration is doing. It has nothing to do with Republicans, Democrats. It has everything to do with Christianity. That when you see an administration that has a budget that says it doesn't care about the wisdom of its children, has a budget that says let the seniors who work all their life lose their social security. When you have a person, an administration that really care less about health care for all and don't mind losing 20 million people so that other people might get rich, the church should be standing up hollering and getting mad because that is the mandate from our Christianity, to love thy neighbor as thyself, to do for others what you want them to do unto you, that it is our job to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, and the church should stop. I'm going party side and getting mad at what the heck is going on. 
you can't sit there and support that kind of mess and call yourself a Christian because I was a Christian before I was a Republican or a Democrat. I don't care what color he is. Right is right. said that when, when it was a different color and a different party and I ain't going to stop preaching truth now. But we should be mad. president ran on a platform how he was going to be different and he's just the same. He might be even worse. And people want to argue politics. Christians should be discussing righteousness. Black folk marginalized and want to see, have the nerve to be, to on, and want, want to send somebody else back. I have a problem with that. Us, that, that, that a few bad ones have, have put a stigma over all colored folk. Yet we do the same thing when we see somebody's hair wrapped up. Because you've been integrated and you forgot where you came from. But let me tell you like OJ learned, you can integrate all you want, but you will wake up one morning and find you just as black as you were when you laid down. I know y'all don't wanna hear that, but, but you should understand that Ralph Ellison's book ain't too far removed from our reality. credit is due can came with the wrong purpose came with a bad perception came with bad presumptions but I'm glad he came because he stayed long enough to meet the right people and hear the right sermon y'all ain't hear y'all ain't hear me that, that means every Sunday ain't for you I can make you mad. I may have made you mad right now. And it ain't because I lied, because I told your truth. But that's no reason for you to exit. He has been treated and, 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 and never seen, didn't know, nobody knew his name. And yet for over 30 years plus, I don't know when they started bringing him. But he kept coming. Say I can't get in, but I'll, I'll take a seat at the door. Somehow, he didn't give up. No matter how they treated him at the door, every morning, there he was. He looked like a nuisance to those entering. Oh, but sometimes what's a nuisance to you is a wake-up call from God. He, he, he looked like he was maybe getting on your nerve, but it was God's consciousness reminding you of the generosity of your heart and, and what it means that how when you go in, he said, he knew this, he said, I'm going to stay here long enough because he knew something about prayer. He said, he knew that when people came to prayer, they should have a generous heart, but he knew that prayer could soften the heart. He knew he going to get paid one way or the other, in or out, because God was going to work. He kept on coming. Tell him he met the right people. And he got the right message. Silver and gold. Have I not? That what you want, I can't offer to give. But what I do have 
there's a name that sits above every name. What I do have is a power that can straighten out your situation. I'm trying to help somebody. What I do have, I don't have in my pocket, but what I have is in the name of Jesus. Y'all ain't got it yet. I know it sounds cliche to you, but I believe there's still power in the name of Jesus. I believe that he still is a healer. I believe that Jesus still is a deliverer. I believe that Jesus is still a way out of nowhere. I believe that Jesus is...